that we're certain the city attorney was going to be able to get that to the court. Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah, it's our witness tree. What is what kind of tree? What kind of tree? Um, so bad. I think it's a white oak. A white oak. Yeah, it's definitely an oak. I'm not sure if it's a white okay, oak. Okay, because I I'm an not going to recognize what trees are. So yeah. it's an oak. Okay. Oh, it's one of the few that we're certain was here during her lifetime. There yeah. might be some other ones that were alive, but they're over on the brothers' property. I would say at least a century and a half. Century and a half. I every time I come out here and I look up and look at this tree, I'm like, that's an impressive tree. <laughs> it's outlived many generations. Lopes and Ancestral Bridges and William Harris. Big round of applause. And the wonderful Amherst History Museum, our wonderful colleagues just up the street, who um, are among many important oh. objects are also the um, stewards of Emily Dickinson's one existing dress. Some of you may have seen that before. So today we are gathered here to share some information with you um, in celebration of this wonderful event. Um, we're going to be hearing from two of our guides here at the Emily Dickinson Museum who have dove into the archives for today um, to do some research, to pull together some really great information about the Dickinsons, about their politics in the Civil War era, and about the black men and women who worked here at the Emily Dickinson uh, homestead for the family, or in the employ of the family um, in the 19th century. And following hearing from Melba and Chris, we will be hearing from William Harris, um, and who will bring us home for, for our stop today, a descendant of Charles Thomas. Thompson, who you're going to hear more about in just a moment. So without further ado, I think I'll be turning it over to our wonderful guide, Chris Faubert, who will be followed by Melba Jensen. Thank you so much, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing? Good. It is amazing to see so many people as part of this. Thank you all for being here today. I'm honored to be here with you. Happy Juneteenth. This is such a crucial event to commemorate. And I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers beyond that. Something like this takes so much work. So thank you all for everyone who was involved in putting this together. So I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about the Dickinson family. As one of the largest land holding families in Hampshire County, the Dickinsons fell within the ranks of New England's provincial elite. Provincial by the standards of Boston's superior size and wealth, but elite within the context of a small agricultural town like Amherst. The Dickinsons often look to black families like the Newports, the Thompsons, the Holdens, and Irish families uh, like the Mars and the Kellys when seeking hired laborers. Beyond this, when we think a little bit more about that labor, it took on various different forms. It was domestic work. It was other types of work, like short-term day laborers. And still others maintained the orchards, fed the livestock, and tended the farm that once stood on this property. Headed into the Civil War, Edward Dickinson's influence in the region as a lawyer, Amherst College's treasurer, and a property holder translated into stints in local and state politics at the very moment that slavery became the dominant issue in national life. Despite the fact that Amherst was rural and fairly isolated when compared to neighboring towns and cities like Northampton and Springfield, Edwards' one term in Congress pulled the Dickinson patriarch into the sectional debates that threatened to pull the nation apart. Deeply conservative in his political beliefs, Edward embraced a specific reading of American history 
that viewed compromise as the essential component to the long-term preservation of the United States. It was such a philosophy that led him to oppose slavery's expansion while at the same time rejecting Thomas Wentworth Higginson and other abolitionists who called for the immediate uh, rejection of slavery and the immediate destruction of slavery unqualified. Edward Dickinson and Thomas Wentworth Higginson remind us that a variety of opinions existed throughout New England when it came to the question of slavery. For a conservative New England landholder like Edward, secessionists and, um, and abolitionists embodied different brands of radicals whose demands threatened to snap the fragile bonds of union that held the nation together. But for abolitionists like Thomas Wentworth Higginson and others who were filtered throughout New England who were abolitionists, they arrived at the conclusion that if the government was truly derived from the will of the people, an American nation that restricted democracy to white men and enslaved millions of its residents had violated one of its most important founding principles, and of course, that was individual liberty. Indeed, it was these same beliefs that led Higginson to become one of the secret six who provided moral support and aid to John Brown as he planned his eventual failed raid on Harper's Ferry, Virginia on the eve of the Civil War. In calling for men of goodwill to reach across the sectional divide and work together to avert civil war, Edward, he chose instead to vote for a short-lived third party that echoed Dickinson's call for compromise. Even after Southerners fired on Fort Sumner and young men from Amherst marched off to war, Edward adamantly rejected any notion that the federal government could unilaterally abolish the institution of slavery. Taking to the pages of the Springfield Republican, the prominent newspaper in the region, he authored an editorial bitterly denouncing what he called, quote, the heretical dogma that immediate and uh, universal emancipation of slaves should be proclaimed by the government, end quote. Given that the South rose up in a violent insurrection that sought to destroy the United States to protect the institution of slavery forever, many found Edwards' continued push for compromise wildly out of touch with the dangers of the moment and denounced the 58-year-old as a quote-unquote fossil politician. Edwards' conservatism is an illustration that race and class led Amherst residents to experience the war years in a variety of ways that in some cases intersected and in other ways were entirely unique. Some, like Fraser Stearns, who was the son of Amherst College President William Augustus Stearns, volunteered to serve early on. Others, like the Stearns' longtime black servant, Charles J. Thompson, remained on the home front, where they saw how deeply transformational the war could be for those who never saw active combat. When Fraser Stearns fell at the Battle of New Bern, North Carolina in late 1862, and his body returned to Amherst, it was Thompson who collected the remains at the Amherst train station. For Thompson, the reunion was likely deeply personal, as numerous accounts suggest that Frazier composed the love letters that the illiterate Charles sent to his wife Eliza when the two were courting one another in the 1850s. It is also likely that Thompson viewed Frazier's body because he advised the family to maintain a closed coffin, and he held a vigil with the body until its burial. According to Fraser's sister, Abigail, Charles removed the fallen soldier's sword and provided it to one of Fraser's sisters, telling her to, quote, put it away and don't let your father see it. After William Augustus Stearns moved to the community to become Amherst College's president in the mid-1850s, Charles Thompson became a staple at the college as its caretaker and groundskeeper in addition to working for the Stearns family. As college treasurer, Edward Dickinson would have likely been aware of Thompson because of the numerous duties he performed on campus. And in fact, we think he did know of Thompson through the college because Charles, his wife Eliza, and their adopted daughter Mary moonlighted at the Dickinsons to supplement the family's income by working at, for example, a tea ceremony that Edward held for Amherst College graduates on a yearly basis. Other black laborers filtered in and out of the Dickinson family's orbit during the war years. 
when Emily Dickinson's brother, Austin, and his wife, Susan, had their first child, Ned, in 1861. The two hired Abby Shaw uh, as a nursemaid. Aunt Abby, as she was affectionately known, lived in the maid's room next to the nursery on the second floor of Evergreens, which is the house you see next door to this one. Uh, she uh, kept watch over Ned, especially at night when Austin and Susan were asleep in their first floor bedroom. And having lived as a slave in Georgia before acquiring her freedom, Shaw moved to Springfield, Massachusetts, where she was recommended to the Dickinsons by the editor of the Springfield Republican, Samuel Bowles, and his wife, Mary, both of whom were friends of Austin and Sue Dickinson. Given that Charles and Eliza Thompson likely found employment at the Dickinsons because of Charles's connections at Amherst College, and since Austin and Sue hired Abby Shaw, per the Pol Bowles's recommendation, finding employment with one of the families that composed the town's provincial elite opened avenues that increased the likelihood of achieving some semblance of economic stability that likely wouldn't have otherwise been as easy. As the war years progressed, the frequency of casualties was not the only indication of the transformational nature of the Civil War. After President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, the entire nature of the war shifted to make the abolition of slavery its central objective. Previously barred from military service, black men could officially enlist in the military for the first time. 20 of Amherst black residents, including Christopher Thompson, his brothers, John, James, and Henry, and Christopher's son, Charles H. Thompson, a different Charles Thompson than the one I was just referring to at Amherst College, took up arms to liberate the millions of African Americans who remained enslaved in the South. Whereas Fraser Stearns, the Thompsons, and others willingly marched off to war, some were drafted. But a provision in the Conscription Act that instituted the Northern Draft allowed for a draftee to pay the steep fee of $300 for a substitute. That amounts to about $5,000 in current day money. The Dickinson's class status protected Emily Dickinson's brother, Austin, from potentially suffering the same fate as his good friend, Fraser Stearns, uh, in marching off to war because Austin paid for a substitute. The working class African American and Irish families whom the Dickinsons so often turned to when in need of labor weren't financially able to pursue a substitute and thus lacked the same options that were available to Austin and other white families who could pursue such a course. The complicated relationship between the Dickinsons and African Americans who lived in Amherst illustrates how the collision of class and race took on a variety of forms during a transformational period in this nation's history and in this town's history. Now I'd like to hand it over to my colleague and good friend, Melba Jensen, who will offer us some thoughts on how the Civil War influenced Emily Dickinson's poetry, how Thomas Wentworth Higginson played a direct role in her life, and ultimately how the Civil War continued to shape the lives of Amherst black residents in very public ways as the nation transitioned from war to the uneasy process of reconstruction. So Melba, if you please. And students at Amherst College demanded that they be allowed to fire the cannon donated to the college in memory of Fraser Stearns. Fraser's father and the college's president adamantly resisted it's likely that Charles Thompson averted the potential crisis by driving a spike through the touch hole of the cannon, disabling it altogether. When it became clear the cannon could not be fired, the crowd dispersed. Thompson's essential role in the Stearns family was unmistakable. His quick thinking saved a distraught father from having to confront a patriotic mob to determine to fire a cannon that represented his son's memory and possibly the conflict that could have ensued out soldiers of color. The fate of the Confederacy was decided by Sherman's march to the sea, Higginson wrote. But Sherman found the South, when he reached it, held almost exclusively by colored troops. Next to the merit of those who made the march was that of those who held open the door. That service will remain among the laurels of the Black Regiment. of steel that suddenly looked into ours with a metallic grin. 
the cordiality of death, who drills his welcome in. Higginson's military service may have pushed Dickinson to confront the inevitability of emancipation. Her father, Edward, might resist it, the war could delay it, but would Higginson's soldiers ever lay down their arms without it? Can the lark resume the shell? Easier for the sky. Wouldn't bonds hurt more than yesterday? Wouldn't dungeons soar or grate on a man free just long enough to taste, then doomed new? She concluded the poem, take not my liberty away from me.